Good morning. Welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today in the new year. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I will be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy, all the way from Paris, France today. Dr. Murphy, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Those who have seen the series before remember Dr. Murphy as the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, or public health questions each week here on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest COVID headlines through today, January 8th, and answering some viewer submitted questions. We invite you to submit any questions you have down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with the US COVID statistics, average new hospitalizations per day are 4,151. In 2022, the same week, we saw 5,577. Average COVID deaths per day, 171. Same week in 2022, 455. New vaccine uptake for adults, 19.4%, 65 plus adults, 38%, and children at 8%. Dr. Murphy, your reactions to those numbers? Well, this uh, was predicted um, because what we're seeing right now is the consequence of the holidays. In other words, everybody moving around, meeting family members and friends that uh, are, are out of the typical routine, and that just spreads things. And so this is the prediction. This will be the high point kind of um, of the pandemic. And you can see uh, a couple of interesting things uh, uh, to note that um, the new hospitalizations is getting pretty close. This is per day, 4,100, uh, pretty close to what we saw in 2022. So um, a lot of hospitalizations, but the system can handle it. They can handle that much. Now, the, um, the good news here is that the average deaths per day are 171. I mean, it's not good having 171, especially since it was below 50 a few months ago. But in 2022, it was 455. So there's a, there's a lot less serious disease. And it just brings up the whole fact that the, the virus is a little bit, bit milder uh, than it was before. And the immunity in the population is better. And so you get immunity two ways. You get it from getting infected and you get it from your vaccines. And people have had all the vaccines that were offered to them, like five or six injections, including the new one that came out in September 2023. And people that just had the first two doses, I mean, it's it's really all over the place. But any prior vaccine and any prior infection helps. Now, still, the bad news is that the vaccine uptake of the new vaccine, it's not a booster now, it's a brand new vaccine that came out in September, is uh, the uptake is really low. It's about half of what we see with flu, approximately. So people are taking the flu shot, but they're not taking the COVID shot for some reason. You can even take them at the same time. So the adult rate is about 20%. And for 65 and over, <coughs> excuse me, it's 36, 38%. That's better, but um, not. it could be much better. In children, very low, 8%. So people are missing work and um, being sick. And you know, COVID is, can be a severe disease. So uh, I noticed that in four states, including Illinois, mask mandates for hospitals uh, and healthcare facilities has gone back into effect. So if you're going to go into the hospital, you've got to wear a mask. Now, in the patient care areas, that's been, that has always been the case. Um, you go into a patient room or a clinic, you have to wear a mask. But now it's like even in the lobby areas and the common areas that the public is allowed into. So it's really kind of everywhere. So uh, four states have done this. Illinois is one. And it's probably just a very good idea. And I would imagine that in the high respiratory uh, infection season, which is December, January, February, maybe March, that's going to be the case every year, I would think. Uh, it's very likely. 
Uh, we have a new strain floating around. Um, it's the JN1, and this is now over 50% of all the cases. Um, it's just even easier to transmit. That's why so many people have had COVID recently. Um, but it is not any more serious. So that's the good news about that. And um, this is uh, just kind of the way it goes uh, with uh, these infections. So we've got COVID out there, we've got flu, and we've got RSV, and they're all very high. The wastewater uh, data that they look at for virus is high, uh, but this is exactly what we expect. This is These are the months that we get that. Mm -hmm. And staying on the vaccine topic, one of the questions that we received this week was referencing a British uh, paper from The Telegraph, actually. And the question was, do you think the latest booster is safe and necessary? This person is immunocompromised. And as we've talked about throughout the pandemic, sometimes those with immunocompromisations have a lower vaccine effectiveness from just one dose. So can you break that down for us? Well, a couple couple points. One is that it's not a booster. It's a brand new vaccine. Now, I don't know in the UK exactly what they're doing. I think the Moderna and Pfizer are the new vaccine. I, I don't know about the uh, the AstraZeneca one, uh, which is the other one they are taking there. So um, the, um, uh, but still, uh, immunocompromised people don't respond to any vaccines as, as well as people who are not immunocompromised. Now, in the United States, we were giving people even an additional booster shot uh, if they didn't met, mount any antibody response. But the current recommendation by the CDC and the Advisory Committee for Immunologic uh, uh, Practices is uh, the ACIP is uh, recommending that if you get that new vaccine from September or later, and that should be enough. You don't have to take two of them. But uh, it's just these are just things that we know. And um, you just take your dose and, you know, use common sense, wear a mask when you need to. And if you get really sick, you take, you get treated. There's a treatment, which mm -hmm. we're going to talk about. Thank you for covering that. We did have another question submitted, and this is a patient who had COVID near the holidays and then a few weeks later tested positive for mono, mononucleosis, infectious mononucleosis, and was wondering if there was a link in between them or there could be because the time where they would have gotten COVID and the time where they would have gotten mono was very similar. Well, uh, a couple things. One, Epstein-Barr virus causes mononucleosis. Um, it can also be, it's associated with certain lymphoma cancers and there's other issues uh, that Epstein-Barr causes. And virtually everybody in the United States at some point, everybody in the world gets Epstein-Barr virus at some point. Um, and it lays dormant uh, in the body for the most part after you have the initial uh, infectious part. Now, getting these at the same time is kind of no surprise. You're out there in the community, you've got COVID, you know, you're also at risk for, you know, flu, respiratory syncytial, and even mononucleosis if you haven't had it already. So I don't know how old this person is. Um, but uh, the other uh, kind of unusual thing is that with uh, COVID infection um, and mono, that uh, the Epstein-Barr can reactivate. There are m multiple studies that show that the Epstein, the dormant Epstein-Barr virus in your body reactivates. And there may be some even link with long COVID and some of the signs and symptoms. Like uh, many of the people feel with long COVID, the same kind of symptoms you have with mono, you know, fatigue and just tiredness, swollen lymph glands, whatever. And um, that's, that is, Associated. I mean, they are um, uh, they're they are linked together. So the COVID is 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 uh, triggering that uh, reactivation of the Epstein Barr. Mm -hmm. And if the subject of mononucleosis and long COVID is something you're interested in, please feel free to put that in the comments down below. We can look into more of that. There are plenty of great studies on that topic, okay. but moving on, we talked a lot about well, before, the treatment well, plans. Well, well, oh, yeah. Move on. Yeah. Uh, Yes, they are linked, but everybody with long COVID does not have Epstein-Barr. Uh, I've been seeing patients coming in with long COVID, and they're full of all these Epstein-Barr tests. So all long COVID is not Epstein-Barr. So keep that in mind. Yes, that is an be. excellent, excellent point to make. Yeah. 
So it just it's not the cause of long COVID. It's one mm -hmm. of the many causes. Yes, very important distinction. And mm -hmm. speaking of COVID treatment, like you were previously, there has been some overview studies on Paxlovid. And there are a couple different angles that we want to go through. But first of all, can you just tell us about the efficacy of Paxlovid? Paxlovid is a combination of nermatrelvir <laughs> and ritonavir. Ritonavir is a, a drug we use for HIV but we use it in very small doses here to increase the drug level of the other uh, active uh, component, of the active component. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's, been, it's been out there for a while. It's very much underutilized. And the uh, people that take it, the earlier you take it, the more effective it is. If you take it within five days, that's the optimal. The, the faster you take it, decrease that virus, you get better faster, you don't end up in the hospital as often, you don't, you, you live longer. So the, um, uh, if you take it after five days, it still works, but the effect is not as uh, great. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you take it within the five days, it's about 90% effective. I mean, it's a very effective drug. Now there are some important drug-drug interactions. And so if you can't take uh, Paxlovid with the current drugs that you're taking, which is going to be in a, a small subset of patients. Uh, there's an alternative, molnupiravir. And in some of the big population studies, it works almost as good as, as the Paxlovid. And they don't have those drug-drug interactions. There are some other potential side effects with, with that drug. Also, some people have some weird taste feelings and stuff, but you're only taking the drug for five days, twice a day for five days. And um, you can pretty much slug through it. And, and some drugs you may have to hold during those five days, but you have to talk with your pharmacist and your doctor about uh, how you manage it. But it's just a, a five-day treatment, the same uh, uh, length of treatment we do for flu with Tamiflu. Mm -hmm. So um, very underutilized. I've had multiple calls over the holidays with uh, People who are older, that puts you at risk. People with a history of cancer, that puts you at risk. People who are smokers or have some lung disease, put you at risk. And, and they're not getting prescribed the packs of it. I don't understand what's going on uh, with the mm -hmm. kind of efficacy data that uh, keeps just more and more data just pile up showing how effective uh, the drug is in preventing long COVID and, the, and, and severe COVID. Mm -hmm. And sticking on the Paxlovid topic, we previously, towards the end of the year, were talking about data that suggested that Paxlovid may have a greater rebound with COVID-19 infection than plain old COVID-19 infection itself. There was a massive comparative study uh, put together by the CDC going over all of those data. Can you please break that down for us? Yeah, they've been really seriously looking at this because, you know, the original worry was that if you take packs of it, you're likely to rebound. That was the first message that sort of got out there. Well, if you look at it closely, um, people are, quote, rebounding, whether they take packs of it or not. And there's no difference uh, if you take it or you don't take it. So that's that's good news because packs of it doesn't cause it. But it also tells us a little something about this particular viral infection. In other words, typically when you get infected, the, the number of bacteria or viruses goes up, 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 and your body puts the immune system response in, or you start a treatment or whatever, and then it goes down. That's very typical for most things. This is not true with COVID. We're just learning more about this. It's kind of in the same course of the disease, it's going in waves. Uh, and that's really what's happening here. And uh, it's not due to the drug. Uh, I think the question is, if you rebound, should you take another course of drugs? Um, some very well-known public health authorities uh, have uh, had this happen to them and they've taken another course. Now, mm -hmm. the drug is not approved for that, but you know, if there's a way to get around it, the drug is not being given out by the government anymore. But um, you know, typically insurance will pay for it. There's some kind of way typically to get this if you really need it. Uh, and you should uh, go through all the hoops that are required uh, to get it. If you've got Medicaid or you have Medicare, 
the big plans uh, typically all do pay for it, uh, but because it's also expensive, it, mm -hmm. it's not a not a cheap treatment. Of course, you know, you know, I've heard it costs seven hundred dollars for the five days. Well, you know, I mean, hardly anybody pays retail, and you know, you know but it it is an expensive drug, even if you've got a big copay. Mm -hmm. um, this is not how to handle an epidemic or pandemic, you know, by, you know, some people that can't afford it, can't take it. I mean, it's ridiculous what's going on, but uh, that's the way it is in our, the U.S. health system. But mm -hmm. uh, there typically are ways to work the system and figure out how to get it. And fortunately, in Illinois, in the city of Chicago and state of Illinois, um, those systems are in place. And, you know, we have... Uh, there's a nice program. It's a little bit complicated to get it, but you can do it. So you really should try if you're at risk. Mm -hmm. That's very good to know. And switching gears for our final story here, we've talked a lot about malaria, a lot about mosquito-borne uh, infectiousness and diseases throughout many weeks in the end of the year. But some really interesting great news came from the WHO right before the holiday break. They pre-qualified a second malaria vaccine. Can you tell us about this vaccine? Yeah, this um, WHO announced on December 21st that um, they pre-qualified the R21 Matrix M vaccine, uh, which was manufactured by the Jenner Institute at Oxford University and the Serum Institute of India, and they recommended it. And uh, the, uh, th this is uh, really important, especially for children, because they're the most at risk for dying. Uh, from malaria, which is still a huge killer uh, in the world. Um, and the original vaccine, the uh, GSK uh, vaccine, uh, got pre-qualified last year, or actually now two years ago in 2022. And both of them are safe, they're effective, uh, they'll help uh, reduce the mortality rate in children uh, who carry the heaviest burden of the disease uh, you know, it's 500,000 deaths in children each year, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's it's a huge, huge problem in certain parts of the world. So, um, you know, it's just really great news that uh, uh, this is just another thing we can do in preventing malaria in a very vulnerable uh, group, children. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a great addition, and it's going to help quite a bit if people can get their hands on it. Absolutely. And on that note, we will be wrapping up for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, for your time and expertise joining us all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and we're going to, because we skipped last week, uh, we're going to be doing a, a second session on Thursday of this week. So we'll catch up for January. Absolutely. We'll see you on Thursday, everyone. If you have any questions for Thursday, please submit them down below. Thank you. Thank you.